So uh, my name is Tim Keyports. I'm the president of the Old Seminole Heights Neighborhood Association. And I appreciate you guys taking your time tonight to join us. Um, as we go through the guest speakers, we'll introduce them. So uh, first up, we've got uh, TPD, we've got uh, Lieutenant Gideon. I don't think I said that right. And I don't see Michael Gwynn, who uh, Lieutenant Michael is our coordinator between the Neighborhood Association and TPD. He is one of the Neighborhood Watch coordinators. Uh, I haven't seen him jump in, but he might be on here. So in any case, I'm gonna turn it over to you if you'd like to uh, take it away. Well, first of all, thanks for having me guys. Um, so I haven't done many of these, uh, these Neighborhood Watch meetings, but I did check in with uh, the detectives, uh, I said earlier, but I'm, I'm a lieutenant here in District 2, which is north of Hillsboro. Um, so I checked in with our detectives to see what's going on in your in that area to see what the main issues are. And the main issues that they're seeing come across their queues is um, the usual um, unlocked vehicle burglaries. And we've had a, a big rash of stolen vehicles due to the vehicles being left unlocked and um, the key fobs being left into them and left inside of them. Um, I have some numbers here. Like I said, I'm, I'm north of Hillsboro, so it's going to be our D5, D4, which would be uh, basically the river east to uh, 30th Street and north of Hillsboro up to the river. So as far as robberies go um, from 2019, and this is from October 1st to so, uh, December 31st of 2020, it looks like we have two more robberies uh, than we did last year in those two zones. Um, we are substantially down in residential burglaries, uh, more than 50%. Last year we had uh, 37. This year we're down to 14, which is very good because last year around the same time there was a, a, a group of kids that we eventually identified that were the main culprits in, and probably about 75 to 95% of those. Um, the stolen vehicles are down in your area, but in our district, we've seen, like I said, a rash of vehicle thefts like we we haven't seen before. So um, that, that's been a big issue for us. Uh, vehicle uh, burglaries are also down, about 15 uh, this year. We had 22 last year. So I, the detectives, we've uh, acquired a lot more message boards, and we wanted to know what a good place would be for in your, your community to put them up as far as putting out a public service announcement to, to lock your vehicle and so forth. Uh, certainly, uh, we see your posts, not you, but uh, the chief information officer posts that go out on next door. And um, the only thing I would suggest in addition to that is uh, some of the Restaurants in the area have got message boards. Um, that's one possibility. And then utilizing the neighborhood watch coordinators, that's uh, feedback you could send up the chain. Uh, in our area, we've got a number of coordinators who work with individual block captains uh, on the civilian side, if you wanna say it that way, um, to try to get the word out. And then most of the grids have a Facebook page or a website. Some of them have other means and they're more than happy to, to take a flyer that you all put together and send it around that way. There's a very strong group up in the Northeast. So that would be around um, like Broad and 18th Street, some, you know, right up along the river. There's a pretty strong group up there that's been around for a good 20 years. Uh, in the historic area, it's not as well um, coordinated amongst the neighborhood watch groups, but we do talk amongst ourselves. So we'd be happy to continue to share that information. Okay, well, we appreciate that. So, uh, and, and we are going to actually be putting together a squad in district two, uh, it's a community outreach squad. Um, so what there's gonna be, our hope is, there's going to be more communication between the uh, uh, the uh, community organizers and the, the police department with this specific squad. And their main purpose is going to be that, is to be the liaison between um, with you and the police department. So that squad will be starting um, 
actually on the Monday after the Super Bowl. So once they, that's going to be a, a sergeant and a corporal and a, and a group of handpicked uh, officers that are, are going to be um, on that squad. So once they, they get that together, they're going to be reaching out to all of you um, and there'll, there'll be much more communication than, and it's, it, at least in district two with the community organizations. So. Okay. No, well, that's terrific. I'll, I'll be happy to share that information with the other neighborhood associations in the greater Seminole Heights area. Um, a number of them, for example, Southeast Seminole Heights, they have a very strong neighborhood watch uh, presence. And um, we do occasionally meet as a group, the uh, boards of the different associations have it done since COVID. But uh, this is exactly the kind of thing that we would share amongst the boards so that some of the smaller associations, for example, Seminole Heights East, which is out at about 22nd Street, just north of Hillsboro, uh, they have a very small number of neighbors just because it's a small area. But they, of course, are always looking for information like this. So, Christina, thank you very much. Is there anything else you'd like to share? No, that's all I have, unless you guys have any questions for me. Okay, and um, for those who are online using a computer, if you wanna pop it into a chat, um, if you have any questions. Um, I did see somebody put a note, we should have a kiosk at the garden center. And I'm not sure if that means, I'm not sure what that means. So Florence, if you wanna expand upon that, I'm not sure if that has anything to do with uh, the police, some kind of a, a kiosk for the police. Um, but in any case, if you can expand upon that, but Christina, if you want to hang out for a little bit, you can, if you need to drop off, um, I will reach back to you through uh, Zalavia, uh, who is of course our uh, liaison. Excellent. And like I said, well, once we get that up and running, you'll have a, a more communication between us in this district and uh, they will be reaching out to the organizers once they get, they get set up. So okay. I appreciate your time and uh, stay well. All right, thanks for everything you guys do for us. Of course, have a good one. Okay, so sorry for uh, me going a little slow here. I've got to let people into the meeting. We're over 20 now. And I don't think John Allen uh, ever signed in. So I'll just go ahead and cover this slide for him. John, Alan is, uh, works, he's sort of like a number two guy there within Parks and Rec. They have an interim director, her name is Sharissa Hills. Uh, she's a longtime Parks and Rec employee and she took over for uh, Paul Allen. I've had a, several meetings actually with her through Zoom and uh, John is um, trying as best he can to improve the parks across the city. And you'll see a number of them here in a minute, but these are mm -hmm. some of the things that they've done for us in our specific area. So if you don't know where McDougal Park is, that's a long sly on the east side of Nebraska. Uh, I went out to Henry Ola with Andrew Carranza, who of course people know he's a big uh, promoter of Henry Ola improvements. We noticed that the bleacher seating was uh, very dangerous broken splinters. So Parks and Rec put in all new wood seating in the bleachers. Um, I won't read everything on here, but the garden center is starting to look really good. Um, there is a sign in front of the garden center right now. And just like all the parks, it's being changed from it's currently zoned residential. And Parks and Rec is working with the city to get all the parks redesignated as uh, permanent green spaces so they can't ever be developed something that should That's have been done actually a, it's actually a um with the county um oh thank you use development has to be county. So. okay yeah good point lynn thank you um so there's an orange sign in front of the garden center there on the central i looked at it a couple of nights ago and it says it's being changed so of course it'll be protected down the road uh, the hockey rink doesn't get a lot of attention. The hockey rink is on Nebraska, just north of the Oaks of Riverview, um, and therefore just directly south of the Hillsborough River. And um, it is a roller rink. Um, 
and the Lightning have been out there uh, kind of promoting hockey, um, and they've been doing some renovations out there. Uh, THA is Tampa Housing Authority, which runs the Oaks. Uh, Wayne C. Pappy Center has got a shade structure. I'm not familiar with that. If anybody wants to chime in. Um, um, that's been there for a while, but it is new. Um, also at the park at the Oaks and Riverview, they just installed a new playground. Okay, great. I yeah. was, uh, I need to get it back over there. Um, I think it's a little bit of a hidden gen, gem. Uh, people think that it's exclusively for the residents of the Oaks and that's my understanding not accurate. So there's a community center there, there's a senior center. Uh, you've got to do some coordination um, and in some cases you have to pay to utilize some of those facilities, but the uh, something to be aware of for the residents. And then uh, one final note, the Henry Ola after school program is still shut down uh, due to the size of the facility and COVID. And I just found out yesterday that the soccer season at Henry Ola has been canceled completely um, for 2021, which of course uh, that's not good for those who are, uh, are involved with those programs, but we we'll keep going here. I saw the the hockey rink because I went on your on the OSHNA website and um, uh, I had not noticed that we had this park. I was wondering, do they uh, do they rent uh, the shoes to go on this hockey hockey rink, or does everyone have theirs, or, or what? Yeah, uh, Florence, I, I can recognize your voice. Um, I honestly don't know anything about it. I mean, I think it's rollerblades. Um, I did it many, many years ago, um, but I think you'd have to check with the Tampa Housing Authority um, to, okay. uh, to find out more about that. Um, I, I put this slide together just to remind people that, you know, it's not just our parks. There's a lot of parks in the city and I'm going to turn yeah. it over to Lynn now to talk about this map that uh, her team in Neighborhood mm -hmm. Mall put together. Um, yes, uh, neighborhood involvement. We spent a lot of time uh, researching all the parks and going and taking photos and learning about all the different amenities. Uh, so we have 15 different parks um, within uh, the old Seminole Heights footprint. Um, but we also include Lake Roberta because we have so many members that in Hampton Terrace that do consider themselves uh, part of Old Seminole Heights. Um, so we have all 15 parks and if you go to, on to our website, which is just oldseminoleheights.org and you put the uh, forward slash parks, you can actually see um, a whole list of all the different parks, including links to where you can uh, see them on a map and how to get there on a Google map. It also lists the amenities for, for each park. And if you haven't had a chance to visit all 15, we highly recommend it because there are so many different things. Every single member of Neighborhood Involvement said it's been the, their favorite project in a long time because they haven't had a chance to actually, they never went to all these parks. They didn't know they existed. Um, so get out and get a chance, get, you know, get some fresh air and get out and enjoy the parks. Um, we will, we have some more things coming uh, for neighborhood involvement that also will encourage people to get out and about. So stay tuned. Okay, can I say something? This is Florence. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm, well, until I had, uh, I broke my foot and I have a boot on right now. I was participating in um, uh, Hillsborough County Take a Hike where you go through all these different parks on a list and you get a patch or a medal after you do all this. And I was thinking we could do this just for Oshna, Oshna take a hike and you have to do all 15 parks and walk a mile in there. Okay. And that's that's... interesting at, uh, at uh, the Allen Wright Park. <laughs> ah, yes, that's right. <laughs> well, you'd have to go around and around. 
<laughs> run and run and run and run and run and run. <laughs> yeah, that would be a pretty quick uh, hike through Alan Wright. Uh, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and uh, keep moving through the slides. And why don't you guys hold your questions to the end? Uh, and certainly put uh, any comments in the chat, and then we can uh, address them that way. Um, but that's an interesting idea you had, Florence. I know that Lynn and Neighborhood Involvement is also looking at uh, possibly doing like a bike map to visit each of the parks. But again, let's uh, let them put that together because that's uh, still a lot of work to get done. Yeah. So Patrick, I'm gonna turn it over to you now to uh, introduce the upcoming meeting you're gonna be holding. All right, I'm going to start my video here. I have, I have the boss with me this evening. Four month old Nathan here. So my name is Patrick Thorpe. I am the owner of Allegedly Design. Uh, I do a lot of work here in the neighborhood. Uh, probably seen a lot of the houses that I've done. I don't typically advertise them just simply because permit records are public documents and I don't like to advertise public documents for everybody. But what we are going to do here is an accessory dwelling unit workshop. Basically, myself and Eric Cotton, who is the interim manager uh, for the City of Tampa Zoning Department, are going to break down the Seminole Heights Zoning Code and give you a quick overview of everything that you need to know and look at when you're planning to build an accessory dwelling unit on your property. So Seminole Heights is very special in that our zoning code is the only one in the city that by right allows for accessory dwelling units on properties, but there are specific requirements and prerequisites that you need to know about your property in order to build one of these. So we're just gonna break all that down and give folks a starting point so that they can understand what it, what is needed in order to get an accessory dwelling unit. All right, awesome. Well, uh, Patrick, again, congratulations on uh, joining the dad club. Uh, I know there's some mom club members out there in uh, the video land as well. So don't want to uh, not mention them, but uh, that's awesome. I'm still waiting for the $10 membership dues for your son. You send those in uh, tomorrow. We'll be give you a little bit of a break on that. Uh, no, well, I'm just kidding. We're, we're looking forward to this uh, workshop, and um, I've had several people reach out to me um, commending Patrick for the idea, and um, on my street alone, there are a couple of ADUs under construction, and one is um, being looked at, so it is the hot thing right now. So uh, I intend to uh, participate and listen in as well, because uh, you never know, I might want to do something like that in my house. So I'm going to move on to um, Mauricio Rosas. And Mauricio, I'm going to uh, blow your mind here, because uh, this slide you haven't even seen. It just showed up about uh, maybe 10 minutes before the meeting. Um, so our friend Alex Henry of FDOT, I had beaten him up about uh, providing an overview slide and uh, lo and behold, he put it together. Um, so Mauricio is gonna be uh, talking about these four key intersections along Port Avenue and uh, updates to those intersections. So Mauricio, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Tell me when you wanna advance. And you're on mute right now. So as you can see, there's quite a few different things happening on Florida Avenue. It's not just Florida Avenue, but this this is this has been the focus right now uh, in, in what we've all been doing. So first, uh, first off, go to the slide on Florida Avenue in Idlewild. Uh, and many thanks to Tim because he went through and he made these little design changes so that you guys knew exactly where this was going to go. Uh, so according to the state, uh, right now, this is uh, design is underway now. Uh, the, the program, the construction is programmed to begin uh, in fiscal year 2022. Uh, and what this is, it's actually across um, 
a lit, i.e. I an actual light fixture that will help us cross the street from one end to the other. And it's, and even this diagonal part, pattern that's there, there will be some availability to where the lights will actually get turned on when you're crossing the road. So it's just a very simple uh, uh, change in that area, but it's a necessary change. Um, next, which would be... Yeah, I didn't know which order you wanted to go in. Yeah, uh, uh, fl Florida, no, uh, Florida and Wilder. Okay, I'll do Florida and Wilder, that's fine. So this is a project that's a, a partner with Tampa and it's to install signalized pedestrian crossings at this location. Uh, construction actually has started on this, but unfortunately the city contractor went uh, out on a, uh, another uh, business mid project. So we're waiting the city to bring in new, a new contract on board until that time, uh, we can't really provide any more information as far as a timeline is concerned. Uh, but that is something that's happening. And again, uh, something needed. Uh, hopefully we'll continue to have more of these as well. What's your next slide? Uh, yeah, and I apologize, Mauricio. I know I changed the order on you. That's fine, um, that's fine, that's fine. So what, what I was thinking is you could start at the south, which is this one, and then we'll work our way north. Uh, this specific intersection is very important for the schools that are to the east. Um, the uh, high school and the middle school, because we have a lot of kids that cross here, uh, not trying to get to the independent, hopefully, but uh, just to get to back into their neighborhood. And I have gone up and down Fort Avenue, like most of you, when the school lets out. And it is very scary uh, when these kids are trying to get across. Can you tell me a little bit more detail? Is this going to be like Ida Wild, where it'll be like a push button and then crossing illumination or is this going to be a full stoplight uh, hold or on. do you know we're looking at Florida Avenue. yeah no I do know hold on I'm just looking at Florida and Wilder okay now this is a signalized pedestrian crossing so yes you press a button and the lights will change and that's when you get to walk so the cars will stop completely but only when it's a pedestrian. It's not gonna be one of those lights that you just, it's not gonna be just another stoplight. Okay, and the really reason this one is really critical to our neighborhood, uh, for those who don't know, the box that's to the bottom of the slide is basically the big empty field across from the independent. Cappy's is sort of to the upper left, not really on, I guess it is sort of on here. In that empty lot is where the new um, Health Mutt uh, is going to move to from the corner of Henry, um, sorry, Hannah and Central. So they're leaving and they're going to move to this location and they're going to be in, putting in a brewery there. So this is going to, this whole lot is going to be dramatically different in the next year or so. Um, so you're going to have a lot more people going from the brewery across the street to the independent and across the street to Cappy's and back and forth. So, um, I don't think they even are aware of that. Uh, the owner of health Mont reached out to me and I told her just to sit tight, um, because I was waiting for this information to come in. But for those of you that have dogs and cats, that's a pretty significant change. All right. So now we're going to continue North. On Florida Avenue. Oops. Florida and Giddens. Okay. I, I want to add one other thing too, with the changes being done. So the the Idlewild, the Idlewild changes and the this other change is leading the conversation to making some changes on Osborne and Florida Avenue. Uh, there's a lot of traffic that goes through there, and yep, that's a big place for kids, uh, teenagers. Uh, you got the middle school, you have the high school, you have the library. Uh, so there's a lot of activity there, and nothing has been planned yet for Osborne in Florida, but it is a discussion that we began, and hopefully we'll start seeing something uh, drum up either in, probably not in this year's uh, TIP meeting, which is the Metropolitan uh, Planning Organization Transportation um, <clears throat> public hearing that's held once a year. But hopefully in 2022, we may have it added in there because Osborne is a big concern as well. 
so Florida Avenue and Giddings. Uh, so uh, the, the state is installing a crosswalk here with a pedestrian refuge island and rectangular rapid flashing beacons. Woo! Uh, they're still trying to work down, uh, nail down the construction schedule. Uh, but again, it looks like it's early or mid 2022. Uh, this is going to be tricky because the Seminole Heights, um, uh, the Seminole Heights Mobility Study uh, may actually have some effect on this um, uh, because in the future, uh, not too far away, I, within a 10 year period, we may be seeing some changes on Florida Avenue um, and uh, this may actually go away and then come back in a different way. Uh, so it, it's kind of a cool thing. I, I, I'm really excited that uh, uh, the, the, not only the city and the county, uh, but the state have really um, stepped up to the plate to really work on, on safety. Uh, but that's a very simple, simple design concept. Um, and believe it or not, the whole idea is to slow traffic down. And folks, the, we do have one big complaint on both sides. We hear speeding all the time, and then we hear too slow all the time, but we can't have both. Um, and the goal is to reduce speeding on Florida Avenue, period. And this is one of those things that helps, is uh, all these different little intersections, whether it's a pedestrian light, or whether it's a hard light, whether it's a, a crosswalk, all these things help to slow traffic down. And we don't need people speeding through Seminole Heights anyway. Um, uh, hey, before you move on, I'm gonna jump businesses. back in. Um, mm -hmm. If you look at this slide closely, uh, I actually had to figure out where this was because guess what? There's an apartment that is built right there in the empty lot immediately north of the Red Star Rock Bar, which is got that uh, those triangle shaped shade uh, mm -hmm. in the top left. So here FDOT sends Mauricio uh, and I a slide and it's uh, so out of date that the new apartment complex uh, with the grassroots Cava, which is on the Google map in the top or the bottom left, isn't even depicted. So you can see how rapidly things are changing in our neighborhood. Um, you know, the poor FDOT guys and the city of Tampa <laughs> planners uh, are trying to improve the area and the area is changing um, before they can even get projects like this done. So. Um, anyway, that's why I added those uh, orientation um, to the slides. Okay, the next one yeah. I think you already talked about is, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. This is Wilder. Uh, Wilder, Wilder. Uh, I think we already did Wilder. Yeah, we've, we've talked about Florida and Wilder. Okay, so next. What do you and have? here's the last one. Uh, Florida Avenue and Millwood. Hold on a second. I got my notes. Okay. So on this one, they're installing two signalized pedestrian crossings, um, and they're going to be at these two different locations. So the design is underway, um, and again, this is one of those things where funding. Uh, and construction of it, activities are there. And so this will start hopefully in early 2022. Um, again, it's just another, uh, another way to help reduce uh, speed and hopefully to improve um, uh, uh, pedestrian safety and even those who are driving their own safety as well. And then um, again, this is sort of this is... ties into the, uh, the the restaurant that is uh, on the east side of Florida Avenue, and then of course the Grand Building, which is all that's depicted there is Revolution Ice Cream. But I think we all know there are Mechanitas in there. Or there used to be the wine um, uh, the wine shop. I'm not saying it right, and hopefully that will come back. Um, I talked to Jamie Kozar, and she's considering bringing that back once we get out of COVID. Uh, but there's a lot of activity there um, happening, especially in the evening with lots of people going out of, in and out of King of the Coop and the new barbecue uh, location. So 
Uh, again, I, I think everybody should recognize that Mauricio has put a lot of work into this and uh, beating on FDOT to keep the uh, Heights Mobility Project front and center. Um, this project wasn't even on the books um, a few years ago. It was supposed to be studied much later uh, in the timeline and some of the leaders in the neighborhood got um, them to expedite and move the mobility, heights mobility study to the left on the timeline. And now you're gonna start to actually see results. So uh, Mauricio. Yeah, Kim, Kim, Kim Overland, I wanna add a couple of th more things um, uh, that, that don't need slides. And uh, one of them was uh, Ola and Central Avenue Bike Boulevard. Um, we have funding for that. Uh, it's for 22 and 23. It, and more than likely the construction will start uh, sometime in 23. Uh, the thing that might happen would be at this year's public hearing where we may want to make sure that does not get moved down the list because there, there is funding. So uh, mark your calendars. June 9th is the public hearing day. Uh, uh, the other thing, uh, two more things. Uh, West Hillsborough Avenue from Hesperides to Armenia. Um, there's going to be uh, additional uh, safety improvements made for traffic signals and pedestrian crossings uh, on the west side of Hillsborough Avenue, west of Nebraska Avenue. Um, there might be some resurfacing, but that'll come, that'll come later. Um, uh, but they're focused now on possibly adding more traffic signal pedestrian crossings. And then uh, one last note, uh, I-275 north of downtown. Um, uh, we were kind of surprised a little bit that we are seeing that the Florida Department of Transportation is saying that they are looking to make um, two, two additional lanes on the outside. So one going north, one going south. Uh, from the downtown interchange all the way up to Hillsborough Avenue. Uh, this seems to be um, not what was discussed originally uh, last year. So this is something that will take a little bit more work to find out why this change was made. And hopefully we can uh, work together so that we don't see any more widening of this highway. And that's it. I am done. Hey, Mauricio, as always, you did a phenomenal job. Uh, please keep uh, Doug Jessup in the loop. Uh, I ran into oh, yeah. him a couple of days ago, was not able to attend. Um, and as always, please put your comments in the chat window. And um, I see that Tim Bruce uh, put a note in and they, yes, agreed crosswalks are critical. Um, the sidewalks on Florida were part of the Heights Mobility Project. A number of OSHNA members went out and walked the sidewalks and pointed out the fact that they are not ADA compliant. Um, a lot of them have got um, telephone poles and street signage right in the middle of the sidewalk. So if you were to walk abreast with two people, uh, you'd have to actually get into trail formation and trying to ride a bike on a sidewalk is dangerous because if you don't hit the telephone pole, you'll end up in a fence, chain link fence for a used car lot. So it's, uh, it's aware. Uh, we brought it up many, many times. Um, it's an old neighborhood and a lot of this stuff was not thought about back in the day. Uh, we've got a number of residents, uh, Ray Reed, Susan Albert, who are filing complaints about all of the sidewalks and the lack of ABA compliance. But uh, the answer is that they're not going to repair them or not going to fix them until a repair is needed. So as intersections are redone, then they will put the curb cuts in to allow people in uh, wheelchairs, et cetera, um, to use the sidewalks more appropriately. I'm not trying to defend the city, it's just the reality of the budgets. And it's also a big part of the tie up of the all the transportation tax, the half billion dollars now of sales tax that's been collected that has not yet been spent. So we'll see if all of a sudden we start getting more sidewalks. 
As far as the Nebraska side uh, acknowledged, um, we have been working with the Hampton Terrace and other neighborhoods to try to get a similar type study done over there. Uh, so more to follow as we go into 2021. All right, I'm going to keep moving. Um, again, Mauricio, great job. Julio, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about the library. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure being here with you today. Um, I wanted to fill in everybody on what's going on with the library system in general. Uh, libraries in the counties are in different stages of opening. We have multiple libraries that are closed. We have libraries that are offering curbside service only. And then we have a few libraries that are actually open at 25% capacity, which means no seating, no meeting room use, um, and when I say no seating, no seating other than at a computer, which is also limited to one hour. Uh, one of the reasons that we are in this stage is because we have been working in different aspects of the recovery, of the COVID recovery. Uh, we have been working, library staff have been working at testing sites, now vaccine sites, at the COVID um, hotel, off of Fowler, uh, at the EOC. So as of last week, I believe that we had about 60 employees that were activated and we're expecting to have more activated in the next couple of weeks as more vaccines are received. But in the meantime, what has the library system been doing? Tim, if you can go to the next slide. We have, and I'm just gonna give you a highlight of this. Um, we have had over 56,000 posts on Facebook. We have created 250 videos uh, for YouTube, which it, we've gained about a 390% increase in YouTube following. We have most of those videos, about 50% are story times. Tim, if you can go to the next, to the next slide. We've also been doing outreach. We've done not that many, we've done about seven, but we've reached uh, about 4,200 people. And we launched our mail, our borrowed by mail and over 37,000 items have been borrowed by mail, which is free. All you need to do is mail it back or drop it off at a local library, but we'll ship it to your home for free. Next slide, please, Tim. So I, I said some of the things that we've been doing, but what has the branch staff been doing? Well, we've been doing many of those things that I highlighted above. We also telecommuted uh, between March 23rd and May 10th, and we completed over a hundred hours of training. We weeded, the whole, we weeded the whole collection and inventoried it. And we provided since May, uh, curbside to about 3,800 customers, which includes free printing, scanning, copying, faxing, free face masks, picking up materials, and we create crafts for children to take home. And we also, during this time, have hired a few new staff members at the Seminole Heights Library of Victoria, uh, Tim's, Caitlin Kim, and Brigitte Meyerhofer. Any questions, anybody? Yeah, and as uh, most of you know, you're on mute. So best if you put that in the uh, chat window and I can always circle back around to Julio. Uh, Julio, as always, you and your staff there at the library are top notch. Uh, really appreciate rolling through uh, an uh, unusual year to say the least. And, um, you know, a lot of communities would just shut the library down and just say, you know, go home. But you guys have... Uh, been going in every day and doing what you can. Um, I was really shocked. I didn't realize that as a county employee, you guys could get pulled, you guys and gals could get pulled into all sorts of other activities that are outside the library. Um, so COVID response, obviously job number one for the country right now. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving. And again, uh, pop your comments in chat if you have any questions for Julio and his team. Okay, hey, we're just about done. Uh, 
unfortunately, as I just said, with COVID, we've decided as an association that we are not going to try to do the home tour in April. I think everybody understands why. Uh, so we had talked and planned and um, harangued at meetings about possibly moving the home tour to the fall. And in the end, uh, we ultimately decided just to go ahead and cancel it. Uh, so sadly, that'll be two in a row and move it all the way to 2022. So it'll be, barring any more changes, April 3rd. So put that on your calendar, April 3rd, 2022, which is hard for me to even imagine because that's more than a year from now. Um, but it is what it is. So um we will be doing a normal tour uh, at that point. Uh, it's deconflicted with Easter. I'm going to assume the city will take uh, Gasparilla and move it back to the original timeline that they've done uh, in the past. This year, they've uh, moved Gasparilla well to the right, and it's not until April. So um, um, that is pretty much what's going on with the home tour. We do have some other ideas in the works, uh, which I'm not gonna get into now um, because they're still uh, up in the air, but that is pretty much it. Uh, again, in the chat window, if anybody has any questions, I see uh, Patrick, uh, your home is ready for the tour. That's awesome. So uh, everybody enjoy looking at your nursery. Um, in 2022. So, and Florence, yes, uh, the free tech support that the library provides as well as uh, resources like Canopy, uh, which is free movies that you can stream as a library member. Uh, I've been taking advantage of that. It's been pretty awesome. So I'll pause for a minute here and um, allow anybody else to make any comments in the chat window. Otherwise, that is largely it. We've got one more slide. I think you all are aware of this. Uh, Creative Loafing does their annual Best of the Bay Awards. And uh, again, Seminole Heights as a greater Seminole Heights won Best of the Bay. Uh, it's a little bit old news at this point. But uh, I did go and pick up the award, um, which was basically a piece of paper, and uh, scanned it, stuck it on Facebook. Um, but that is really where we're at. So if I can figure out how to do this, uh, I'm going to unmute everyone. You all can talk to each other because I know most of you all know each other. And um, that concludes the meeting.